Hello, I am Big Ben. If, like me, you are fascinated by all the performers, all the influences, all the tips and all the resources and props mentioned in this podcast, and you want to learn more, then go to www.thebigbenshow.com slash podcasts. There you will find detailed show notes for every single episode, as well as the occasional photo and video. So check it out and get re-inspired about your shows. Alrighty, let's get back to this week's discussion. Oh, 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 oh my goodness, look at these reviews. Listen to this. Hilarious and original, The Times. Um, it is difficult to find enough superlatives to describe Steve Rawlings, The Stage. We'll give you more belly laughs than any comic, The Guardian. High praise indeed, and, um, well, rightly so. This week I'm talking to the great comedy juggler, Steve Rawlings. Take it away, Steve. I guess, right, back in about, I want to say like maybe 1992, I was, yeah. so that's currently currently 26 years ago maybe, I was, I was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was president of my, my, uh, my university's uh, juggling club and uh, right. we, we went to a, a national British juggling convention or some, some convention somewhere in the, in the UK and I seem to remember you being one of the star acts at the public show. Wow. Do you remember anything about that? Uh, 96 was probably Birmingham. Birmingham. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe it was Birmingham. Oh, 96. Yes. That's probably maybe where I, it was. I don't do many of those. So, um, that could be the one. In my mind when I do. No, that could be the one. Yes, because... Was there a leaky tent? Probably, because yeah, because in 1996 I was living in Singapore, but I went back to the UK for the British juggling, the British conventions, and the and the, the European one, which was in France. Yeah, so maybe I saw yeah. you there. Oh, cool! It's yeah, amazing. I it rained and the water was coming through the pack and getting the kit wet. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool! It's amazing. So here, about 25 or so years later. I find the. Uh, You're living in Hong Kong now, is it? I'm in Hong Kong now, yeah. So, awesome. I've been. Uh, well, I mean, when I was, when I was first starting juggling in the UK in the early nineties, I had no idea it would become a job. I had no idea that it could ev- could even become a career, and yet there you were, you were already doing it, full time doing shows. Yeah. So yeah, it was going really well there. Yeah. And I mean, no, carry on. Oh, no, carry on. Carry on. It's okay. I, I guess at the time I was doing a lot of touring with um, quite a few big name acts uh, and quite a lot of TV. I think. Wow. Uh, in those days. Were there like were there like booms of ebbs and flows of of uh, being sort of on TV and in fashion, and then then years when when it wasn't a thing to be on TV. Um, it's more a case. That <laughs> Excuse me. Where um, TV was kind of where you went to and what you did, and then it became less of a thing that TV is what you did because there wasn't much TV left. Right. And when I first started to break in, probably about the mid to late eighties. Yeah. Uh, there was all kinds of TV to do and lots of interest. Um, comedy clubs were just getting up and running in a big way. Jonglers probably had only two clubs at the time um, and if you did those clubs the people um, there was always TV people there always so yeah. every weekend there'd be somebody else to talk to and someone with a project going on or you'd be picked up for Saturday Live or something like yeah. that yeah um, and then I don't know later in the 90s and probably early 2000s there were less and less and less programs to do yeah yeah I do the same program two or three times. Fantastic. You know, one management would go in, one would come out, and they go, oh, we need a juggler. <laughs> <laughs> Call me without realising I'd already done it once. <laughs> oh, so, man, 80s, early 90s, you kind of the right, you were the right place, the right time 
TV right work was there. Right time, I guess right attitude. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I was, uh, and also I was doing something different, I guess. What do you mean by by right attitude? Um, I was hungry. I was ambitious. I worked hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. All right. I, yeah, I, I wanted to move forward and get somewhere. Fantastic. Well, you man, you, it's amazing. Your your career is decades and decades now, isn't it? Yeah, I started juggling at the end of '82. That was my next question. Was 1982 uh -huh. a special year for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's the year when I actually found out what I wanted to do for a living. Yeah. I taught myself to juggling. I was in a very boring, dead-end job called the Civil Service, um, Post Office and Civil Service Sanatorium Society. That does sound <laughs> extremely boring. Where I literally moved names from, it was a union thing, I think, uh, where I moved names from one form to another. And I was really, really bored, and I got a Paul Daniels book and taught myself a couple of magic tricks, which yeah. I didn't really have the front to do. And I learned to juggle from nowhere, really. I just taught myself three balls, and then didn't know how to take it further, and then left it for a couple of years. Then I went to... I didn't really know what to do or where to go. I was doing rubbishy, dead-end jobs for years, uh, about four years. Didn't fit anywhere, didn't like anything. And my backup job was as a lifeguard. Yes. If all else fails, I don't do that for a while because it's, it's horribly boring. And if you get that bored, you switch off and somebody drowns, which wasn't really my plan. <laughs> so um, I went to Butlins as a lifeguard just for something to do, really, have a bit of fun and, you know, just a bit of an adventure. OK, I'm well, just going to jump uh, in quickly, Steve. Just to uh, people who listen overseas, Paul Daniels was the British TV magic uh, magician. Oh, sorry, yeah. And and Butlins is um it's a, it's a holiday, it's camp. A holiday camp. A holiday camp, uh, yeah. An English holiday camp, yeah. Yeah. And Paul Daniels was the man. That's right. Probably about for fifteen years. Yeah. And if you got on his program, that was it. That you there was no higher thing in it in the UK. I didn't sadly, but uh, that was it was a, probably a little bit early in my career. But um, yeah, that that was the one to do if you could. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I went as a lifeguard to Butlins, and they used to make you help out um, with red coat duties as well, oh, yes. which is just in competitions and all the rest of it. And at the end of the season, Salvation Army took over the whole camp, and the kids they bring with them were horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> so all all the junior reds that looked after them knew that and left. <laughs> so they were like dragging people in to help out on stage and they made me kicking and screaming I have to say I didn't want to do it at all yeah got on a stage and just went "Ooh, this is fun and it's the first thing I'd really sort of clicked to first thing I'd liked yeah so when I left Butlins um I went to try and find something else that would get me back on stage yeah. and at the time the mine thing was too expensive I couldn't afford it on uh Butlins wages the clown one was full, and there was a group called Original Mixture. I don't know if you ever met them. No. Doug, Mitch, and Andy, who right. were probably one of the only groups out there at the time. And they were uh, teaching juggling in a place called Oval House, opposite Kennington Oval. So I went there, and that was it. That was all I ever wanted to do after, after learning to juggle with them. Fantastic. After other jugglers, that was it. Oh, that's amazing. All right, let's this. Just backtrack and talk about some of that stuff then. So you actually taught yourself to juggle. Now in those days, there's no YouTube, there was no internet. So how no, on earth did I've you got learn? I've a vague memory of, of maybe seeing someone at a circus do it. My mum, mum and dad took me to the occasional circus. Yeah. And I just worked it out. I really? I could work out five, four balls. Because uh, I did three <laughs> and then thought, well, I'll try four now and couldn't work it out. Oh, yeah. I was yeah. just switching the fourth ball as another third ball, really. But that's still pretty impressive that you figured out the three balls went in a, a kind of infinity sign cascade rather than in a circle. No, it, it was yeah, it was the cascade thing I, I yeah. worked out. Um, yeah. I don't know how, I, I just did. And then because I couldn't take it any further and didn't know anyone else that juggled, that was it for a couple of years. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's still, I'm going to clap. I mean, most people, would, most people who try to teach themselves to juggle have no idea would try to juggle the balls around in, in a circle. Which is much harder, a shower, jugglers call it. Yeah. But actually, to, to figure out it was a, what they called the cascade, where it goes in a sort of a sideways figure of eight. Yeah, wow. Well, 
And um, where did you buy, what did you juggle with back in 1982? Was... Um, well, it was bean bags. Ah. Uh, that, that was pre-82, that was probably um, 79, 80. But yeah. when I first met um, the original mixture guys and the guys at the workshop, um, a few people had clubs, mm -hmm. but they had to come from America, basically. Yeah. And we had um, bean bags, not the ones you see now. There was a, a guy called Malcolm, who once a year would get a whole bunch of cloth and some bird seed, <laughs> and he'd make um, he'd literally so got a plane coming over. That's good. <laughs> it's an international show. It's an international podcast. Yeah. Uh, and Malcolm would make the bounce for about three hundred balls, and if you didn't buy from Malcolm, there were no balls basically. Wow. Um, but the thing was, they, because they were cloth and bird seed, if they ever got wet, they grew. <laughs> they, they became hard little balls of stuff, and then plants would come out. <laughs> so you had to make sure you kept them dry. Ah, you see, people... Yeah, we also tried to make our own clubs, so we'd have like a, a squash bottle with, with the bottom cut Yeah. Off, and uh, half the dog ball stuck on the bottom <laughs> to give it a bit of weight, and then uh, a dowel stuck down the, the, the neck. Yeah, and you tell Obviously kids these days, you tell kids these days that that's what we had to do, they won't believe you. <laughs> what, you didn't order it online on the internet? No, I'm we had to make very it. very old now. <laughs> I mean, there, there were people like uh, the Mendezes, um, who I met later at Covent Garden, who went um, to America and would always come back with clubs. Yeah. And that, that was the sort of the ultimate. Yeah. To, to have proper clubs. Yeah. So I'm and, slightly... And Nicky B came along and made some, which were horrendous. <laughs> They were like caveman rock stars. <laughs> you know, things got better and more people yeah. joined in. I'm slightly the generation after you. So when I started in about 1990, you could you could buy there's some sort of a juggling boom, so you could buy the juggling clubs in the UK. Yeah, the oddballs guys. Were That's out there right, oddballs. Yes, but to get the unicycles that was harder because we'd all heard about this Japanese unicycle called a Miata, and they they weren't available in England, so that was that was the goal right. to get a Miata. I'd never heard of them. D, D, DX is it or DMX were the, the ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. DMs. Yeah, Dave Mariner built those. That's it. Yeah, they they were the ones to have at the, at the time for me. Yeah. And uh, for those of you deeply interested in the history of unicycles, i.e., me, uh, in the 1990s in England, the best unicycle to buy was the DM, maybe the DM Ringmaster. Uh, in Holland. The great unicycle was the Sem cycle, Sem Abraham's unicycle world champion, his family producing that, still a fantastic machine. Uh, and uh, of course in Japan at that time it was the uh, Miata unicycle. These are the big ones that I remember. Alright, let's get back to Steve. Yeah, 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 DMs, yeah, Dave Mariner built those. That's it. Yeah. They, they were the ones to have at the, at the time for me, yeah. I've still, I've still got one behind me. Of the end giraffe, yeah, it's brilliant. I've he had it for 25 good, years, still works. Props. Sorry? He made good stuff, it was uh, good solid engineering. Yeah, mine's still going, I used it this afternoon. <laughs> Were you digging? Yeah, I was doing a, a kindergarten graduation show. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so I uh, I thought, okay, I'm on stage, let's bring out the, old uni big, the biggest unicycle, so I, I took that one out. It still works. <laughs> Was it a five foot? Yeah, it's a five footer. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's this adjustable one, five to eight foot. But the eight foot one's oh, just wow. inconvenient. So you just take out the middle <laughs> pole and it becomes five foot. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> All right, cool. Had you ever been interested in performing on stage before you got on in at the Bucklands holiday camp? No, not even remotely. Really? It didn't occur to me at all. No, yeah. no, no family influences. Um, my mum did some amateur acting, amateur yeah. dramatics. Yeah. And when I was little, I think I played Tiny Tim in in um, uh, the Dickens thing. Christmas but no, Carol. That, that was it. All right. Were there any entertainers that you that you'd seen in the seventies and eighties? Anything that inspired you? No. No. Um, well, in in the eighties, of course, yes. Once I started performing, then it was um, you know looking at other people and seeing what you liked. Yeah. But so for me, when I first went to Covent Garden to start performing, yeah, yeah. I was working as a lifeguard still at um, Lady World Baths in London. I know the place. Do you really? I was, I'm born in Greenwich. I've come from Greenwich. 
Oh, blimey, yeah, I'm a Catford boy myself, so... Uh, South East London. Yeah, where the cabs don't go, yeah. <laughs> and so what happened, basically, was I, I came back from Butlins and I was desperately juggling all the hours God gave and um, working as a lifeguard. And then I tried... I tried and died horribly at Covent Garden, and then I went back again and and stayed out. But the people around at the time who were jugglers, and yeah. there really weren't many. My kind of hero was Tim Bat. Okay. Who was, um, yeah, sort of an eccentric gentleman, mm. former. Lots of stuff with umbrella, hat, uh, apple was a big one for him. And his big finish was uh, juggling a burning baguette a frying pan and an egg and then he'd catch the egg in the pan hold the lip baguette underneath and do a little rhyme about eggs and if the eggs and eat eggs are very nice to eat fantastic and you had john ballinger who was the juggling jester yeah and you had the uh, amazing mendizis yeah which was chris adams and dave mendizi yeah dave spazicky excuse me apologies oh. to dave if you ever this. <laughs> 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 get his name wrong yeah that, those are the boys out there um, doing good stuff now for people again listening overseas um, Covent Garden was the place to go busking or if you wanted to go and see a street performance show in the 1980s still is really in London yeah. a big kind of piazza lots of open <laughs> open space lots of lots of tourists and shoppers so ready made audience walking past and they were they they redeveloped Covent Garden and it became there were all these lovely arty crafty shops around, and they have a great space for juggling there and perform sorry a great place for street performing in general yeah, there, don't they? A lot of performers, um, skills performers uh, made a start there because where else can you go learn? Yeah. So were you yeah, doing? Once you've got these skills, where where can you take it? Unless you can take it, I mean. My first shows, I think I was making yeah, three pounds a go, <laughs> which even then wasn't much. Um, three shows, and I, I made just enough to come back again and have another go. But each time you do a show, you learn a little bit more, you tweak it, you try this, maybe if I do this. And, um, you know, through trial and error and constant pain, you get better. Yeah. And you could. where else could you have done that? Yes, yes. That was it. That was the play. And I, I talked to a lot of performers, and often the earliest shows they began, there's something there that has influenced their style throughout the whole of their career. So for me, my first paid gigs were as a Charlie Chaplin impersonator. And so, up until that point, whenever I'd been on stage, I was always talking. But because about uh, 25 years ago, I got this job as a Charlie Chaplin impersonator. I, I since then, there's things that I do to music, without speaking, yeah. that I've just been that have just been stuck in my style for forever. That's not a bad thing. And how about you? Because not a bad thing at all. How about you? Because you, if you're starting busking at Covent Garden, I'm guessing you don't have background music at that point, and so you're talking. I mean, it's mm -hmm. gag-based, verbal talking whilst juggling, and I think, if I'm right, that's still your style, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, and that's never going to change. Yeah. I couldn't shut up if I tried to. <laughs> I, I mean, I was lucky enough that most of the people I was watching at the time were talking. Yeah. Uh, were interacting with the audience in that way. Um, I never had the skills of the level of you know the top circus guys, so I'd never be able, never have been able to sort of compete on that level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and comedy's always been my thing anyway. I always really wanted to mix the clowning, the gags, the business, the stand up y stuff, yeah. and the tricks together. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, yeah, it, it's it's. The, the character sort of came later. The, what made me me came probably about four or five years in. I read somewhere that you have your hat to collect your money while busking and you put your hat on your head and turned up the brim and that was sort of the first emerging, emerging of your stage character, the stage persona. Yeah, that's, that's exactly true. We were using this hat to bottle with, passing it around for the money. Yeah. And while wait, there's an awful lot of waiting that goes on at Covent Garden. Uh, while well, waiting, I stuck it in my head, and for some reason, that changed me. Yeah. I, I became somebody different with that hat on, 
Um, and I, I annoyed everyone to the point where they just went, look, it, you know, going around, is this funny? Does this work? Is this, <laughs> what do you think? And they said, oh, shut up. And then, look, if you're going to keep doing it, just do it in the show and shut up. So I did. And the show was completely different. I was different. The show was different. There was a whole different vibe about it. Um, and it started to work so much better. Yeah. And also, also with that, obviously, once you start to do something different and something creative, you get a lot more respect from, you know, the people around you. Yes. And more interest. Yes, because you're not copying. It's someone. It's yeah. coming. There's come, something's definitely coming from you, isn't it? It's come from you, and it's it's different. And um, yeah, welcome to the club. You're, you're making your own thing now. And for people who haven't seen you, what would you, what would, how would you describe your character in a in a in a sentence or two? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I don't know actually. I mean, well, it's, put, it's, let's, put, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. Do you ever get clients asking you to do projects and events that that wouldn't suit your character? Uh, do you have to do your? Sh do you have to? Do you have to perform in a, in a different style? No. 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 It's it's always I always perform as I as I do. Yeah. That's what I do, and that's what you get, and that's what you buy. Yeah. I would I would say. Um, sorry. I would say the characters, just funny, ludicrous, larger than life, talking yeah. and juggling with these, doing these honestly stupid silly things. He's a, he's a slightly um, strange, manic, crazy character that's struggling and killing himself to try and do the stuff he's, he's, he's decided he's going to do for you, I suppose. That's right, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a frenetic energy to it. Um, he also kind of he laughs and he giggles a bit, doesn't he, as well? Yeah, it, it's, it's a definitely it's a very strong, rather mad character that, if, if you knew me in, in normal life, is nothing like me. Yeah. <laughs> but um, he's obviously... It's a small part of me that I've just expanded and made much, much bigger. Yeah. Which so, is probably, I think, the way to go if you're going to do a stage character is take part of you that you feel works. Yeah. And see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's. I think it's brilliant. And people should check you out on on YouTube or look at your website and look at your videos. Yes, definitely, they should. There's quite a bit out there now. Yeah. Yeah. The character is. It's. It's so cool. <laughs> it's very, very funny. Thank you. <laughs> Also, before before we move on, there's something I quickly want to talk about. Um, so you started performing um, at Co at Covent Garden busking. I guess this is yes. the early to mid 1980s, something like that. 80 1980s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, is there anything um, you remember about that that scene? Anything good or anything bad? Or is there any? Um, yeah. In what respect? Um, well, for example, or, or it could be something specific. Like, is there anything you you that sticks in your mind? I can remember busking in Singapore in the nineteen nineties, where it was almost unheard of um, mm. to do a performance in in the streets, and they'd certainly never seen a living statue. And my living right. statue act was so simple; I didn't even have to wear makeup. I just mm. dressed with a bowler hat and a pinstripe suit suit. And an umbrella and a briefcase, like your kind of the stereotypical English businessman, and I just stood there in the um, equatorial sunshine, in totally the wrong uniform. Yeah, just and I just stood totally still, and people in Singapore had never seen a living statue, and despite the fact that I got no makeup on, they didn't know whether I was a human being or not. They'd never ever seen anything oh, wow. like it, and it was just wonderful for six months. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. That that's pretty cool. And and then the um, the other statues started to come out. And then there were hundreds of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had the six months to yourself though. That's yeah. Very cool. um, another story for me. I remember busking and um, quite early on, realizing realizing that I've got to keep an eye on what what equipment I leave behind me because someone just stole it while I was doing a show. <laughs> ah. I mean, this this was before there was any. Um, real busking in Singapore, so yeah. um, so um, the audience didn't know how to behave, and yeah. I think one little kid, a teenager, <laughs> just walking along. There's, there's a there's a, a white guy, 
And there, there's there's his bag. I'm going to walk off with that. <laughs> yeah, that's a shame. Kind just, of kills the moment for you, doesn't it? Yeah, it kind of changes the show a bit, doesn't it? Okay, you better give me some money now to pay, pay for all the stuff I've lost. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Common Garden is, is not for lightweights. It was um, getting there at four or five in the morning to wow. sign onto the lists. Yeah. Long, long days. Um, some very, very hard shows, practicing all day, um, working in the snow, in the rain. Yeah. I mean, there are two pitches there. There's one outdoors and there's one in. And um, I've still got very strong memories of uh, being in the sort of nearest coffee shop and yeah. running out while I was still warm enough to do the show. Yeah. And you could feel your hands slowly freezing up. Yeah. You know, as the show goes on. I mean, I, I remember um, a whole, about 12 of us all sort of helping each other out with shows on the indoor pitch because it was so cold where we'd all sort of gather around each other's acts. Yeah. Um, and clap each other loudly and scream and shout and all the rest of it to try and get an audience. Yeah, and yeah. Of those people, now you had probably there was Eddie Izzard, there was Dave Benson Phillips, wow. there was his um, There was myself. I think there was probably John Lenahan, well-known magician and author. Yeah, there was a bunch of us that all, <laughs> all went on and did well for ourselves. Yeah. Not as well as Eddie, I don't think, but uh, yeah, Eddie Izzard. I, I guess the drive <laughs> follows through. Wow. How about the cold? That's something I haven't really experienced much. So I've often worked in really hot countries. Is it hard to perform? Are there any particular problems juggling when your hands are freezing up? Yeah, um, juggling itself is yeah. <laughs> becomes a problem. And boy, does it hurt your hands with the clubs. Oh, I bet, yeah. It, it's basically, it's just trying to keep warm. And then once you get going, you know, keeping it frenetic enough and moving enough that you've just got enough to keep going it till the end. But for me, my last... 10 minutes was a balancing routine so it was easier for me than for some others mm -hmm. but the deal with the Com Garden was that um, if you just came for the summer you're a bit of a lightweight you didn't get much respect Right. but if you did the winter you, know, you were hardcore and you were um, and you became accepted so did you move on to doing this full time first of all you're doing it part time and then pretty soon you said I'm going to go back there again and I'm going to stay at Common Garden full time yeah I, I had one bash at it where it, it didn't work I didn't make enough money yeah. I thought right I have to go back to lifeguarding and then I had I think a two week holiday took it and um, then stayed out that was it as soon as I felt I was making enough to just just about uh, make a living that was it I'm done I'm gone and this is it and was this pre-amplifiers and pre-mics? Were you just doing it all oh, with yeah. it? Yeah. No, we were all shouting. Everyone was uh, projecting as madly as we could. Yeah. When the first guy um, came down with a microphone, he had a handheld radio mic. Okay. And he was laughed out of the place. <laughs> he was ridiculed and pointed at and laughed at. And this is busky and you don't bring, you know, microphones to a busky yeah. show. <laughs> yeah, that's all changed. Oh, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> how, did you have any problems projecting your voice day after day, or did you learn how to make sure you don't strain it? Um, yeah, you kind of learn learn how to sort of ball out as loudly as you could. But it's, obviously, if you did too many shows in a day, yeah, you would start to lose it. Yeah. I had a few problems in festivals where before amplification became normal, mm -hmm. where um, yeah, the voice just went. Yeah, and I think and the voice. The voice is pretty much essential to your show, isn't it? Yeah, I have performed silent, but it's really not me. Right, I don't right. Like it very much. Yeah, I've learned. I've, so I, I, I guess you learn more different skills. The more you perform silent, the more you learn that it can be done, and the better you get at yeah, it. Yeah, I, I kind of go to and fro. I had a silent bit when I was Charlie Chaplin, then I went mm. to talking, um, then I went back to silent for a while. Um, yeah, so my character has changed a bit, but generally I start my show silently, then I have a talky bit with it with uh, with the audience and volunteers, and then I do a big finish, which is also talking. So so it's kind of half half now. Has your character? Yeah, I, I think if you do learn to perform silent, you'll also learn skills and and find new bits mm -hmm. that will work in your speaking show. Yeah, and yeah. Vice, you know. And also, I find. Versa. If I've moved to different countries 
Um, my, 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 the character of my show, the character in my show has changed. So like when I was in England, I was only a, a student and a teenager, but I guess, I guess it was kind of, the audience was more knowing you could be more, you could be a bit, you could be more subtle. Um, when I went to Singapore, you could not be subtle. They wouldn't get it. You had to be really slapstick and yeah. really broad humor just your trousers falling off hitting yourself on the head kind of stuff yeah each time you work for a different nationality i think you have to leave some of your gags behind some of your business but you find new stuff you yeah. find what amuses them and that goes in instead and some of it will cross over because as, as a verbal performer as well as visual i have to take all, all the gags that are reference based like cultural based yes and then you have to look at all the rest of your stuff and take out anything um, that's a language-based joke. And so, it's quite shocking and surprising how many of them you've got. Right. And then what's left is pretty much what you're going to have. So if Although you're performing... You're a couple through incomprehension. Mm. So if you're performing in England and then you take your show to, to Germany, are mm. there any thing, particular things that you wouldn't do in England or you do more of in Germany or vice versa? Oh, um... There have been quite a few changes, but most of it in Germany works. Obviously, all this, again, like I said, a lot of the verbal jokes went. Mm. And uh, Germans have a... The, their language is, is quite different to ours in that the punch of a sentence might not come at the end, as it would in ours. That's right. The sentence structure is different, yeah. The sentence structure is different, and that was a little bit weird as to how to sell the strengths of the joke. Yeah, yeah, now that's that's fascinating because you can't translate it because the punchline would might come at the start of. of... Well, you can translate it, but where do you put the force of the sentence? Yeah, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so that, that was a bit different. Um, and and some some jokes are, are funnier in some places than others. Some just don't work. Yeah. In Japan, um, the most clear reference I can think of is the old bouncy hanky joke. Right. Where you blow your nose on Hanky and then bounce it on the floor or bounce it into your bag, whatever. All oh, right, as, as, um, as if you're you know, snot, as if your bogeys bouncy are bouncy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but in Japan, if you blow your nose in a handkerchief, it's funny because it's quite rude um, and daft, and only a Westerner would do it, really. Right. But bouncing the handkerchief was like, why do you put a ball in his handkerchief? <laughs> it just, it just didn't work. I'm not saying it's a great gag, gag in England no. either, but it, it's a gag and it's a bit of business. And um, yeah, but that's a more clear uh, uh, representation. Also, the biggest laugh I had in Japan was in a very weird place. Yeah. Um, if you know the act well, I do it. Uh, the last 10 minutes is a bottle balancing routine where yeah. I get um, yeah. bottle, try a bottle uh, on my face. And it's basically 10 minutes of extreme overacting where I have a volunteer, a lady from the audience with a tray of glasses running around after me trying to help me put the glasses oh, on. Oh, I love this. <laughs> and um, the biggest laugh I ever got in Japan, the biggest whole biggest gag of the whole show was um, I'd have a running round and running round and running round and then I'd finish that bit and I'd send it back to the audience in, in Japanese, thank you very much, whatever. Mm. And then I'd scream for help. <laughs> and then she'd come running back and Japanese women take these very dainty little steps. <laughs> There was an awful lot of very small, very fast, dainty little steps until she got back to me. <laughs> and then I'd say in Japanese, Otsukari Samadeshita, which means thank you very much for all your hard work. <laughs> uh, so basically, I called her all the way back for nothing. <laughs> and then I've been extremely polite. <laughs> and the mix of the two worked, went over really well for me. Amazing. That's lovely. I like that. That, that would be a nice example of, of where you yeah. take the changes and make them your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that worked really well in, in Japan. Yeah, that was a killer gag. Big laugh. Cool. Oh, that's great. That's great. Oh, oh before we go any further, another tricky one. Could you describe kind of your, your style and your image? For example, describe the bags that you that you, your, your show comes in. <laughs> My travel bags? Yes. Right, I've got what looks like a very large body bag or a baggy little golf bag. <laughs> Yeah. which contains uh, a chair, a Fenwood chair, a table, four golf clubs, um, normally um, a volleyball, and some other bits and bobs. Then I've got um, a size 28 wheelie soft bag, 
mm-hmm. <laughs> that's got most of the rest, of, well, pretty much all of the rest of the show, um, bowling balls, knives, that kind of stuff. When you met, say a um, wee, when you say a clothes. wheelie, um, when you say a wheelie soft bag, you mean like kind of a, it's, it's like a kind of a, looks a bit like a large suitcase kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. A, 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 not one of the hard shell ones. One no, of the canvasy things. Yeah, I've got one right next to um, me here. I'm gonna hit it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got my uh, carry-on bag, which if they ever weigh it, I'm destroyed, because that's full of china crockery, basically. <laughs> I've got two cups and saucers in there. I've got about six china dinner plates, um, some paper plates, and then I think two mouse sticks. And that would be my, that's my travel. Is it, is it quite transportable? How important is, is transportability for you? It's huge. Yeah. I couldn't take any more, I couldn't, expand any more than I do and keep up the work that I do. So can you carry all this be... as one person? Yes, I can. Ah, there you are, yeah. Uh, there'll come a point when I can't, I'm sure, but at the moment it's, it's, all, it's all good. So even the chair and the table, you can, you can carry that? Yeah. Wow. Because <laughs> um, basically the chair goes upside down on the seat of the table, and that goes in the golf bag thing, the body bag which goes over the shoulder, and then the other two bags, uh, one goes on top of the other and are carried along. Yeah. But that's it. I can't take any more. The reason I got into mouth stick stuff is because I need something that uh, doesn't add weight and bulk. Yeah, something carry. that plays small and packs small, rather. Packs small, but can play large and get a lot out of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got um, a set of cartwheels, literally cartwheels, down the, down the shed. It's an amazing trick. It's an incredible. <gasps> I've seen um, it. There is one clip on YouTube of you doing it. Yeah, it, it's an incredible trick. But it's unless I'm in a car, you can't really travel it. Okay, that yeah, that was going to be one of my questions because I remember earlier on uh, mentioning that I've got a giraffe unicycle that I used, that I rarely use, but I use today. And it's the same thing. If you've got a, a unicycle that can go up to eight foot high, it's great. But it's so hard to get that and all the rest of your stuff to to a gig. And if you've got two gigs in one day, it's even harder. Yeah. Yeah, it's the whole sort of travelling thing does wear a bit. Yeah. And you, you find coping mechanisms, but you always find yourself at some point having to do 500 yards to a quarter of a mile with carrying it all. Yeah. Upstairs, downstairs, you know, to the train station, whatever it is. Yeah. Or from the airport to wherever. Yeah. And the last, the last thing you want is to pull a muscle not doing the show. <laughs> I know. I mean, for me, actually, I think often the transport and getting to the show is harder than doing the show quite often. <laughs> <laughs> and also, yeah, you've got to pay for the excess baggage and stuff yeah. when you're doing airports. And even if you're doing the Eurostars, I found out the other day. Oh. Oh, before we, before we, just like they have at the airports. oh, before we move on as well, I just want to explain. Um, you you said a cartwheel, yeah. So you have got this huge, um, wooden wheel. It's, a, it's like over a meter in diameter, and you yeah, have a you have a trick. Well, you have two of them, don't you? And you have a trick where they're balancing and spinning on your head. Is that right? Yeah. Um, there's there's actually three wheels. Wow. I was trying to do the. I was looking to do the app where you have a cartwheel on a pole and you knock it down and you catch the cartwheel on your head on um, a German spike helmet <laughs> wow. that uh, somebody used to do many years ago. Um, and then a friend of mine just went, I've got cartwheels for you. Oh. I, went, what? I was working in Blackpool um, on the North Pier at the time, and there was an act called the Marganers, who had a, um, I think they're Hungarian or Bulgarian, something like that. And they had this Roman um, strongman act that they were doing. And I literally bought all their props and uh, the two cartwheels balance, and the three cartwheels also balance. But the wow. only time I've ever done that, I've lifted it all over my head. And it's probably a good eight stone altogether. Wow. And I literally just fell over backwards. <laughs> 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 so I'm stuck to the two, which is about six stone and heavy enough, really. Yeah. Oh, cool. But, um, I, I rigged the, the bottom, the big wheel, so you could spin it. I took it to... Um, uh, metal worker and got some bearings put in so you could spin the big wheel, ah. which seemed like a big idea until I realised that the the actual wheel rim, which is I don't know probably four cent no six centimeters across, every time that spins, twice every spin your face is covered. 
Oh. Which hadn't occurred to me at all at the time. <laughs> but yeah, I, I got around it, but it made it an awful lot more difficult to learn. Yeah, so if your face is covered, you, that means you're blind, you can't see see yeah, what's happening. Literally, yeah, literally, for, for like a second there, you yeah. lose what you're balancing by. Oh yeah, trick. Oh, that's a tricky one. Oh, that's a, such a specific tip. I love specific tips. So if you're balancing a spinning <laughs> cartwheel on, on your head, beware the cartwheel's diameter is going to block your eyes as it spins past them. Yeah, twice <laughs> every two seconds or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, also, a surprise. also, I mean, street performing was taking off in Covent Garden in the 80s, but also yeah. uh, there was um, uh, stand-up comedy was, was taking off, wasn't it? There was the comedy club yeah. that you, you performed in. Yeah, I, I worked in, I worked the comedy circuit for years, literally, paid my mortgage for years doing it. Oh, really? Um, go on. No, no, that, so was that a big source of your, your in income, percentage-wise? Oh, huge. Oh. Huge, for quite a few years. From maybe eighty six until probably the last one I ever did, around about two thousand. Yeah. Or, although there's still um, the hard bloody hard clubs in, in England, um, the Bearcat. I'll, mm. I'll still do if I possibly can, just because I like them. I like the guy that runs them and the guys that run them, and it's it's nice to sort of just see what everyone else is doing. Wow. So when you were performing full time back then, you were doing Covent Garden and any other things that came your way and one of the things that came your way was performing in the stand-up comedy clubs because there was a boom yeah, at that time. Yeah, it came my way. I, I pushed my way in. Because in those days it was different because ev ev everyone with a, a crazy idea was doing it. It wasn't like it is now. It wasn't like one guy, one microphone. Yeah. There were all kinds of people. There were fakirs, there were magicians, there were a cappella groups, there were group groups, there were duos, there was... Um, improv groups, there were jugglers, there, there was everything. And over time, it's it's come down to pretty much one guy, one mic. Mm. But um, in those days, because there was such a variety of stuff going on, it, it was anyone with any kind of idea, you could just go out and give it a go. Wow. And um, Jonglers was the club to do at the time. There was right. only one club in Battersea when I started doing them. Uh, and I bowled up with all my gear because I'd been watching the shows at the Tunnel Club, which was uh, <laughs> run by a guy called Malcolm Hardy. It was a pit of a gig. Um, <laughs> it was really, really probably one of the strangest and hardest gigs you'll ever do in your life. But I'd seen there and I knew you could just rock up and do an open spot. And I looked at Battersea and I thought, right, that's the place for me. So I bowled up with all my gear and they went, no, 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 you can't just turn up. You have to uh, book a spot. Okay, when can I come back then? Oh, six months. <laughs> okay, fine. So, so literally, I rocked back up in six months' time with all my gear ready to go on stage. Yeah. And they forgot all about me completely. It hadn't occurred to me that they were just fobbing me off. <laughs> <laughs> so I was there with all my gear, and they went, all right, okay, fine, you can do a spot. And I did um, an open spot then, and that went okay. And then they put me on New Year's Eve, bizarrely enough. Wow. After gig. 12 o'clock. Oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. Um, after the band had got everyone um, on the tables singing, dancing, and, and oh. whatever. And <laughs> Sit down again. The, the compare was Arthur Smith came on and said, Right, Lindy, we're going to calm it all down now. We've got a juggler for you. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so I went on, and half of the crowd had decided to sort of let me finish and just, you know, all right, let him do his thing and we can party afterwards. And the other half hated me oh. and wanted me gone. So um, <laughs> they, it start, I got to the bottle balance and it was just about still flying. And then um, one of those farty noisy balloons thing went round the room. Oh. And that was quite amusing. Then I think a matchbox hit the back of the stage behind me, followed by oh. one of the spray cans, the snow spray cans. Yeah. And then a glass ashtray, which oh. narrowly missed, <gasps> I think. Oh. And... Um, Ainsley Harriet, actually, funnily enough, he has a, a brother who's as wide as Ainsley is tall. <laughs> very strong guy, because it went very quiet after the ashtray. Mm. And I found out later what happened was that Ainsley's brother had gone over and had a very quiet word about putting people's faces through windows if they threw anything <laughs> else. Um, and I, I got off, as, I finished the act as fast as I could and got off stage. And um, everyone went back to partying, but I owe Ainsley and his brother 
for that one. But um, from that, I started doing jonglers regularly, and from that, I started getting seen by um, producers and TV guys, and you know, all kinds of people. Wow! All right. And then as as the comedy circuit expanded, I kind of went with it and did all those all those shows, all those venues. Oh, for, fantastic! You know, long, long, long old time. That's amazing. And, and was lucky enough to work with all kinds of people, obviously, like the Jack Dees, the Eddie Izzards, the Lee Evans. Wow. Uh, Marcus Briggs, all, all these people, Joe Brand, uh, Sarah Millican, all, all these people, you know, I was just really lucky to see them all learn their craft and be part of shows with them. God, that's amazing. What oh, a story. Marie. Yeah. Wow. So many talented people. How did you deal with taking your act from the street with no microphone to performing with a microphone in a small on a small <laughs> stage? I've never quite lost the shouting thing, okay. sadly. <laughs> I try, I try very hard, but um, there's something about when you go from street to using a microphone, obviously they all use them now, but at the time where you never quite feel that you're selling the gag right. Yeah. You haven't screwed it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it takes an awful lot of time and patience, but I don't think there's a little edge to it that never quite leaves. And how did you cope with, because um, you need your hands free for juggling and there's a microphone, so how did you cope with that problem? Um, well, a lot of the time they had radio mics. All right. the, the venues would realise that we weren't jugglers, we're going to have to get some radio mics in. And the other thing was um, one of the best bits of advice I've ever had, actually, on uh, sound, mm -hmm. was I'd, I'd lost my voice in the Edmonton Street Festival. And uh, this busker came up and said, oh, I can help you with that. And I went, yeah, yeah, whatever. And he said, no, no, what you need is this. And I ignored him. And he just made me one and brought it to me. And I used it. <laughs> I've been forever grateful to him, even though I was not the most gracious person at the time. And it literally, you go and get a metal wire coat hanger. Uh -huh. And you get you get one of those, um, what they, gerber knives with um, the strong clip thing. Yeah, yeah. And you clip a piece off the metal coat hanger. You bend it into a circle. Yeah. And then you bend the ends back on themselves. Yeah. And then what you do is you get um, a shoelace and yeah. you tie it to the to the basically to the two hoops you've made by yeah. bending the wire back on itself. And you hang that over your neck. And any time um, that your either your headset goes down, I always have like a handheld raid radio mic on a stand yeah. nearby. Yeah. So if I sweat out the mic, the mic doesn't work for any reason. I literally just go and pick up the mic slot it into the little loop I've got around my neck and I'm back in business. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, so if I turn up and for some reason they haven't bothered or they didn't realise or I thought they were getting a microphone and all they've got is a handheld, literally just take it, shove it in um, in the loop and away we go. But don't do neck catches if you're going to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Boy, I will. Do the neck catch by all means, but don't try and flick the ball back up because the yeah. microphone will smack you straight in the teeth. Yeah, I find a problem with that is um, if I've got the microphone in a, clo clo in a clothes hanger around my neck, if I jump onto my giraffe and I do the fake miss where I, I kind of fall off yeah. the giraffe again, I have to make sure my chin doesn't get anywhere near the giraffe's seat, otherwise the microphone gets <laughs> smashed right into my mouth and I will bleed. Yeah. And it has happened. Yeah. <laughs> Some cultures will, will deal with a bit of blood, but um, the others, it, it's just a little too far that they want to go. I, I've got, I've got a clothes. A, do we call it a clothes hanger or a coat hanger? I, I've got one of those bits of wire turned turned into a, a microphone holder, and I've had one for mm. years. And I, I have no idea where the idea came from, whether it was my idea or if I saw somebody. Because I was in Singapore, where there were no other performers, so I don't know how I came well, out. You may probably made it up yourself. Maybe it's I did, yeah. Basic sense, because you, you can buy stuff, for, you know, quite expensive, 20 quid or something. But you don't I need to. Probably more now. Yeah. But you don't need to. Just literally get a wire coat hanger and make your own. Yeah. Take seconds and cost about tuppence. That's right. Also, I've seen you a video on YouTube, a very early one. You you were at a comedy club, and you had a waistcoat, and you just shoved the, the, the microphone... Um, up with the wire up your waistcoat so it was poking out the top was that a regular habit no no, no. it was a last moment desperation probably <laughs> but I mean there is a way also where you can um, use a, a lead mic 
and just there's a way of wrapping it that creates a loop that you oh. can just hang the mic in. Yeah. Um, was it Paul Zanin showed me? I've just forgotten how to do it now. Right, right. Uh, maybe we should get hold of him and get him to show us. <laughs> yeah, get him to show us. We'll, we'll search him down. Yeah, because it is fairly easy. It's just, and it, it's also a lifesaver. Exactly. Yeah, we'll be able to try and search that one out. If anyone's listening and knows how, how it's done, let me know. <laughs> yeah, please share it, because I'd like to know as well. <laughs> how about low ceilings? I guess some of those comedy clubs with small stages, low ceilings, was that, was that ever a problem for your balancing, head balance? Um, as, as long as I can... As long as I've got about eight foot, I'm fine. Mm. But the furniture juggling presents problems then, but I have managed it in an eight foot ceiling. And you haven't got any, any assistant when you're doing these kind of things, so how did you get all your props on and off stage fast enough? Um, normally, I was on either, I was normally, after a while, I was normally closing. Right. Or I was on at the end of the first half. Oh, that makes sense. I mean, um, obviously, there's a little bit of time to clear. Yeah. But if I wasn't, if I was doubling up or running away, then um, either I have to do it quick as I could. And obviously, then you cut back down on the props you're going to use so that you've got a quicker get out. Yeah. Yeah, you look at what you're going to have to pack and run away with and go, okay, maybe that's not a good idea. Maybe uh, I'll, I'll just use the easy stuff. And, and then literally, you have to pack it yourself in front of everyone. It's mm. not great, it's not the officials, but there are no choices there. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. like there's a sound guy there who will give you a bit of a hand or the. Or the no, table. it's a perennial problem. You do a great show, and it's like, oh, this is fantastic. And then for the next five minutes, the audience watches you, watches your butt in the air as you bend over, put everything back in the box, and push it off stage. Yeah, if I've got any pet <laughs> hates, it's the one where you're doing either a party or um, a gala, where you're the last act, and then there's the disco or the band. Oh, yeah. And you've just done the show, and mine is particularly messy. There's stuff yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And literally, I just finish, and suddenly it's like, hey, and now your cover's bare, la la la, and bang, the band kicks up, <laughs> all the lights go out, and everyone gets on the dance floor. <sighs> and you crawl crawling between their legs trying to salvage a bit of your dignity. <laughs> and some of your props before they, you know, people are wearing them as hats. Oh, no. But yeah, nobody tells you, and you can say all you like, I need to do this, this is the stuff that will be left on the stage when I finish. It won't, it won't make a difference. No. Okay. You just have to take it on the chin and it's part of the game. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a favourite microphone? Do you have a favourite microphone that you take to a gig or do you, a corporate gig, for example, or do you use whatever's there? I used to own my own microphone many years ago and it was stolen. Oh. And then I, I've i come to the decision for myself that I won't ever have one. Right. I don't have my own. Um, if you want to hire me, you need to provide sound. Yeah. I think that's good because uh, it means they've sound checked. When I was yeah. touring my own mic, everyone expected me to be the sound guy. Yeah, that's, that's not right. Throw that's things right. For a living. That's, that's right. not my deal. Yeah. Um, and also, you probably find that the in house system is the best you can have for that place. Because yes. It's tuned to that place. Yes. And the other thing is, you'll, you'll find yourself turning up three or four hours earlier than you normally would just so you can set your sound right. Exactly, yes. I agree. Same, same here. And, you know, if it goes bad, oh, that's your fault. As opposed to, well, you know, I yeah. did my best, but the sound guy was... <laughs> that's true, that's true. Oh, one of the weird so, things... Those are my reasons. A yeah. lot of people don't agree with them, I think, but yeah. that's my thing. No, I'm, I'm the same with you on that. I use whatever they've got and whatever, whatever they have sound checked during the day, I'll, I'll use that. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's a headset... Sound from it. Yeah, if it's a headset, I'll use that. If it's... um. If it's uh, a handheld mic, I'll I'll, I'll use a, use that clothes hanger and, and hook it to my under my chin. <laughs> yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. That's that's how you get the best sound, I think. And I'm going to leave it there because there's more stuff to put in about Steve next week. If you want to check Steve out. Uh, in the meantime, his website is steverawlingsjuggler.com and uh, I'll be back in a little while with part two of this great interview. Woo! Good stuff. Right, talk to you again soon. This was Meet the Entertainers and I am Big Ben. Each episode takes a surprisingly large number of hours to prepare, record and edit and check 
and re-edit and re-record and edit again and throw in the bin and mend my computer and take it out of the bin and redo it from scratch and then post it again. So, if you're getting something out of this series, here are three things you can do. Number one, support the podcast by going to thebigbenshow.com slash podcasts and making a donation. Number two, subscribe or share these podcasts or give me a good review on iTunes. And thirdly, get in touch. I'm always looking for more people to interview. My email is ben at thebigbenshow.com. Many thanks. Talk to you again soon.